Uh, Brian, please. Afternoon, Brian. How are you? How's it going? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Okay, uh, my name is Brian Rahm. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral uh, associate with the New York State Water Resources Institute. Uh, we're at Cornell University. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Uh, move on with my testimony. So my testimony will address the following subjects. One, pertinent wastewater and cuttings data from Pennsylvania related to similar issues potentially faced by New York. Two, wastewater acceptability at publicly owned treatment works or POTWs in New York with an emphasis on recommendations provided by New York Water Environment Association, it's a professional group, which I'll say uh, NIWEA instead. And then three, wastewater treatment capacity in the southern tier of New York and thoughts on future development. Uh, throughout, I will try to highlight uh, some language from the revised draft supplemental generic imp impact statement, or what I'll call the S guys, uh, as well as some New York regulations. Um, so, point number one, pertinent wastewater and cuttings data from Pennsylvania related to similar issues potentially faced by New York. Uh, some of this has been talked about uh, by previous speakers. I'll just go through it quickly. Um, I just want to uh, outline some, some definitions real quick so you understand what I'm going to talk about uh, subsequent. Uh, brine and frac fluid, also known as flow back and produced water, includes water used for hydraulic fracturing. Um, in the Marcella Shale, frac fluids consist of water, again, mixed with approximately 8 to 15 chemical additives per well. Uh, according to the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, which is the uh, interstate body uh, in charge of regulating water withdrawals in the Susquehanna River Basin portion of New York, Pennsylvania, and other states. Uh, they have data from 2008 to 2011, uh, where they say that about 10% of the water injected into each well returns to the land surface within 30 days. Um, it's, about, it's an average. And the rest remains underground. Um, once the well is in production, relatively low volumes of produced water or brine will continue to come to the surface. Uh, this is different from drilling muds. Drilling muds uh, include fluids used during the drilling process to cool and lubricate the drill bit and motor and to transport the cuttings to the surface. Uh, overall, mud volumes are not high compared to flowback, uh, but can contain chemical additives uh, and metals and things that do require treatment. And then finally, cuttings, according to the Eskice, rock chips and fine-grained rock fragments removed by the drilling process and returned to the surface as part of the fluid. Uh, so with these, uh, with these definitions in mind, uh, there are a few treatment options or disposal options. These have also been covered by, by some previous speakers. Um, we have, number one, I'll say on-site or off-site industrial treatment facilities. Two, uh, reuse with pre-treatment on-site or off-site. Uh, I want to make the distinction that a lot of times when we talk about reuse or recycling, it, it goes through a treatment process first and then they reuse it. Uh, generally, I, I know some companies have tried to reuse without treatment, and I, I think from what I've understood, their, their results weren't, weren't particularly good. So usually there's some sort of treatment uh, involved in, in the reuse. So three, underground injection via federally regulated deep wells. There's been a lot of discussion about those. And four, publicly owned treatment works, again, POTWs. So in Pennsylvania, it is possible to get information on trends in terms of wastewater treatment and disposal because of recent establishment of a statewide tracking system. No state in the region other than Pennsylvania has yet reported data on wastewater management, although West Virginia is in, in the uh, beginning stages of this. Uh, so it's not clear if these numbers will translate directly to New York, but they do provide some trends that, that might be relevant uh, if we're trying to you know, learn lessons from our neighbors. Uh, New York has proposed such a system, although it's not uh, exactly the same. So how are certain Pennsylvania wastes being handled? This is based on Pennsylvania DEP information from January to June of 2011. It's a publicly available database. It goes back uh, a few years, but not very far, because again, it's something they just set up. Now, in terms of brine and frac fluid, uh, according to the database, which is an industry self-reported database, um, so I can't necessarily vouch for, for the numbers exactly, um, but according to that database, roughly half is reused for subsequent frac jobs, again, likely following industrial or some other form of treatment. Uh, and the S-Geist does support this by saying that reuse is expected to be significant in New York. Uh, roughly one-third of the water, uh, the brine and frac fluid from Pennsylvania, is sent to industrial treatment facilities. None of those facilities, according to the database, are located in New York. Uh, about 5% uh, of, the, of the wastewater does go to deep injection wells, mostly in Ohio, but also in other states like West Virginia. 
less than 1%, according to the database, is going to PUTWs, all of which are located in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, we've heard the, Pennsyl or the Pennsylvania DEP has asked operators to voluntarily stop going to POTWs. There's some evidence in the database that this has been occurring over the last couple of years. I think this is probably just one of, of several reasons why that trend is, is happening. As far as drilling muds and other liquid waste, uh, in terms of where they're being disposed of, it's roughly split between uh, what they're calling reuse and industrial treatment facilities. And then again, you have about 1% to 2% each for POTWs and landfills in terms of the drilling muds. Solid waste, so the cuttings are almost uh, exclusively going to landfills. Most of those landfills are in Pennsylvania. It's about 60%. But there's a significant amount of cuttings also coming to New York. Again, according to the database, that number is at about 30% of cuttings. So it's worth mentioning that uh, treatment of these wastewaters, even at sophisticated industrial facilities, usually leads to uh, some sort of byproduct, a solid or, or concentrated liquid waste that usually needs to be handled either by landfill or, again, uh, some sort of deep well injection or other form of treatment. New, tr new treatment technologies are being developed by a growing water service industry in Pennsylvania, although many are not yet in wide use. I think we heard about some crystallization technologies earlier. Uh, so, okay, so that's point one. Point number two. Wastewater acceptability at PUTWs in New York, with, and I'm going to be talking about some recommendations that were provided uh, by NIWEA, which is a group that I had a chance to work with uh, in, in making some of these recommendations, as well as with other issues uh, related to, to Marcellus Shale. So I want to briefly give an engineer's perspective on this. Um, some of these recommendations are a little technical. Apologize for that. Um, so according to NIWEA, existing or new POTWs that utilize physical chemical treatment processes may have the ability to successfully treat specific shale gas wastewaters. Uh, however, only two such systems currently exist in New York, and we just heard from Paul Droff from uh, Niagara Falls being one of them. Uh, successful treatment depends on the ability to understand and characterize waste composition over time and the capabilities of the specific treatment system it's being sent to. Biological treatment plants, the vast majority of facilities in New York, likely will not be able to accept wastewaters without significant pretreatment. Uh, with the possible exception of some drilling muds that may be less complex than some of the uh, flow back and produce waters. If treating shale gas wastewaters were to be an option, NIWEA recommends that each POTW wishing to, to accept this kind of waste uh, review their facility. Uh, they examine the, the types of waste that they're, that they're accepting and, and their treatment capabilities uh, and see if they can meet their regulatory obligations. Uh, they also suggest revisiting uh, the assimilative capacity of receiving water bodies. So those are the streams or rivers that those plants are discharging into in terms of uh, particularly TDS or, or salt. So can those rivers or streams uh, accept any further loadings of these kinds of constituents? Sometimes that's the case and sometimes it's not. Um, Pennsylvania in particular is uh, already in, in bad shape when it comes to TDS in their streams. So confirmation that it can protect pre treatment plant personnel and equipment from harm and damage, um, something that maybe isn't talked about as much, uh, the actual workers themselves, making sure that they're safe. Analysis of the effect wastewater may have on treatment plant sludge and residuals, those, those are the solids, and whether the POTW, POTWs can uh, cost effectively manage and dispose of them. Uh, NIWEA also uh, recommends that POTWs confirm they have the authority to stipulate monitoring requirements as well as the ability to reject wastewater that does not meet those requirements. Uh, lastly, NIWEA recommends that POTWs give consideration to testing each, each load of new wastewater, especially for radioactivity. Uh, the revised draft of the SGEIS, as well as some of the new uh, proposed regulations in Part 750 of uh, NYCRR, address some of these concerns by requiring that each, of each batch of wastewater, sorry, leaving a well pad be tested for, for TDS, NORM, and BTEX, uh, requires testing for influent and treatability at both public and private, private facilities, fluid disposal plans, and things like wastewater volume monitoring. Uh, I think that, that still leaves an open question in terms of uh, DEC personnel for inspection and enforcement of these kinds of regulations. Uh, the, the regulations do have some pretty progressive terms in there, but again, you know, it's always a question as to whether we're going to have the personnel doing, doing what we say we're going to carry, carry through on. Um, so I just leave that as sort of an, open, an open concern. And finally, point number three, wastewater treatment capacity in the southern tier of New York. Uh, so, so far I provided some information on how wastewater and cuttings are dealt with in Pennsylvania. Uh, and have outlined some considerations relative to the use of POTWs in New York. Uh, however, it is clear that POTWs are not being extensively used in Pennsylvania. Again, that's less than 1% of their wastewater. Uh, and that their use in New York uh, entails a variety of concerns that we've heard about this morning. 
Uh, so what is the available POTW capacity in New York and will they matter going forward? Uh, according to the SGEIS, the DEC performed a basic analysis to determine the potential available capacity of POTWs for accepting this kind of wastewater. Um, and given a, a number of not always realistic assumptions uh, that, were, that were generous, the analysis did still find that there's questionable available capacity, quote unquote, for POTWs in New York State to accept high volume hydraulic fracturing wastewater. So even with, uh, uh, with a scenario that, that assumed that a lot of this would be, would be able to go forward, um, they still found that, that capacity was lacking. Uh, at WRI, we've also performed a, a similar analysis uh, in the Susquehanna River Basin specifically, so more in the southern tier uh, than the whole state. Again, assuming the facilities have the ability and inclination to do so, which uh, very many will not. Uh, results of our analysis support the idea that capacity is limited due to a, combina a combination of public infrastructure size and regulatory constraints such as those proposed in the SGIS. In reality, there are additional reasons to think that POTWs will not be extensively utilized in New York. Uh, for example, no POTW currently has TDS-specific treatment technologies. That would be the thermal distillation or crystallization technologies. Uh, and so that's a, a reason to think that they're not going to be highly used here because they would need to invest in those kinds of technologies in order to meet the requirements. Uh, these analyses, together with evidence from Pennsylvania, suggest that industrial treatment facilities have a greater ability and capacity to treat these waste streams, and it leads me to conclude that POTWs will not really be acceptable for industry within the regulations New York is likely to adopt. Encouraging establishment of purpose-built industrial treatment facilities, either on-site or off-site, has several key advantages over POTWs. The technology is more appropriate. Uh, they have greater capacity. In terms of oversight, assuring compliance of what may be a smaller number of industrial facilities compared to a larger number of POTWs is perhaps more manageable for DEC staff. Uh, and then uh, something uh, that's sort of equally important here, planning and finance. Uh, from a planning perspective, private facilities may be built at a pace and scale concurrent with the development of the shell uh, and may have more flexibility than public entities in choosing business models that accommodate the volatile nature of extractive development. We talk about 30 years um, of development, but there's really no way to predict with any certainty exactly where the drilling is going to happen, exactly at what times, what the price of gas will be over that time. It would be nice to know, but, but we really don't. Um, so just offer the following conclusions. One, uh, due to a combination of evolving regulation, expanded industrial treatment infrastructure, and advancements in treatment technologies, a large majority of shale gas wastewater in Pennsylvania is being handled by private industrial treatment facilities with an increasing model of reuse. Solid cuttings from Pennsylvania development are almost exclusively sent to landfills, both in Pennsylvania and New York. Treatment of most, uh, so conclusion number two, treatment of most shale gas wastewaters is not appropriate at POTW, POTWs utilizing biological processes, which is almost all of them in New York. That being said, these wastewaters are treatable, but only under carefully controlled circumstances, using appropriate technologies with well-trained professionals and adequate regulatory personnel. A lot of caveats. So this likely means sophisticated physical chemical processes, perhaps like the ones in, Ni in Niagara Falls, with some form of thermal distillation technology or its equivalent. Three, POTW treatment capacity in New York is limited, even under the most permissive policy scenarios. Given the relatively stringent regulations New York is likely to adopt, use of POTWs would not represent a viable treatment disposal option for the shale gas industry. Private facilities purposefully designed and located within areas of significant shale gas development could treat wastewater without putting public facilities and taxpayers at risk. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to offer a general comment in support of gathering as much data on these important issues as possible in the event that development moves forward in New York. In the SGIS, the DEC proposes many new measures and data collection requirements, but it's not clear to me at least who will organize and analyze this data, to what extent it will be made public, and how it will feed back into policy and management decisions in the future. I would urge the state to be diligent in its approach to data collection, analysis, and presentation in the upcoming years so that all stakeholders have access to good information and so New York can critically evaluate its approach to complex development issues. Thank you for your time. Uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it your concern then with regards to the public uh, facilities, and it was testified to before that, that if, they're not, uh, if, if they're not geared to accept this type of uh, uh, fluid, then it could jeopardize what they were initially uh, set out to do in the first place with just regular uh, treatment of, of, of the local community's water? I, I think that's true. A, a biological system can be sensitive uh, to 
un unexpected impacts coming coming in, in the influent, uh, and if they're not designed to treat this kind of wastewater, a biological system is not going to handle that particularly well. Okay. You, you wouldn't want to kill off your biological system; it's, it's going to no. stop treating the waste right. that it's meant to meant to do. And, and, you're, and, that, and that would exclude. Uh, I think there's what two in two in the area. You got Niagara Falls, and I think there's also one in the uh, North Tan Tanawanda. Is the North other Tanawanda. One. So they're both in the same. No other facilities. Buffalo area, not not to my knowledge. No. Yeah. Um, and what's your take on the, uh, uh, with the, the industry talking about recycling, uh, utilizing that water, which is also probably a technique for now. At some point, you gotta, it's going to be treated at, to some capacity, but uh, uh, that would also take a burden off as far as having to treat the water as well, right, to some extent? It, it would do what? Sorry? Take the burden off of treating all that water to some extent because you keep recycling the same water over and over again? I mean, it... You are only getting, again, as we said in the last talk, like only 10 to 20 percent of that water back. Um, so you do still need quite a bit of fresh water. Um, that, that depends on the fact that you're drilling as many wells in the future as you were in the past so that, that those percentages stay as they are. Um, I, I think that you are seeing, in, especially in northern Pennsylvania, these new industrial treatment facilities popping up, um, and, and some of them have quite good technology. And that, that is taking some of the burden off, but uh, you, know, you can't relieve the entire burden because you're always going to need some, some makeup water. And you're saying that for the water itself, you're saying that that would be the way to go, as you're, in your opinion? Of the options that are currently available, that, that seems to be uh, one of the best ones I, I can see. You're, you're, you're basically saying that the, the investment in that facility is a private one. It's, you know, if, if it doesn't go well, it's also a private risk. The industry is right. assuming the risk as opposed to a public entity. Um, I would hate to see taxpayers put in money at, at a public facility even to, to upgrade it and then to not have it either perform as it, as it was expected or for 10 years from now for the industry to move on to whatever becomes you know, the next big play maybe up in Canada and, and suddenly the idea that we're going to have drilling here for 30 or 50 years doesn't actually pan out because it's, it's hard to say. Gotcha. Um, there's a risk involved with that and it, it's, a, it's different to ask, you know, a, a private risk versus a public risk are, are two different things. Right. I got you. I appreciate it then. I'm going to uh, pass it over to Senator Gallivan. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you. John uh, Conrad, please. Good afternoon. How are you? 